Oh, fun. Oh, it's so nice to meet you. So it's very nice to meet you too in person. I know, in actual person. I'm very excited to have you at the house. I even swept the leaves off the garden floor. It's properly tidy. I know. It was really, it was noticeably tidy. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I never know what the like. There's a fine line. Have I tried too hard, or does it look tidy but still like a home? I don't think it's possible to try too hard. Okay, and I think that people are sociopaths that don't have stuff. <laughs> okay, yeah, that like, sure. is really creepy. Girl. Like I've gone into a few houses and been like, "Where are your things?" I've got so many things. R- me too. And but- like silly, they're not like expensive things. They're little knickknacks. Yes, yeah, exactly. Love knickknacks. I do too. But I think there's also that. Like, I I definitely I live at the nexus of of hoarding mm. and um, design. Right, <laughs> <laughs> it's really tricky because things are just lovely. Things are just lovely, you and if you travel, times. I know, and I want to see them out. I don't want them away no. in boxes. I want them displayed. Same. It's quite tricky. It is, but look, we're on the same page, so yeah, that's great. Um, this is the first time we've met, but I creepily slid into your DMs <laughs> a while ago. <laughs> oh, it's Van Cotton. Goodness, hello. <laughs> I don't know whether to do it, but your book impacted me so much. I thought, I don't even care if this is seriously on call. I have to tell you how much I loved reading it. Mm-hmm. For so many reasons. First of all, it is beautifully written. You're such a talented writer, clearly, naturally. It just is there. It was so beautiful to read. And it's funny, and it's raw, and it's moving. It's just, it's everything. And I I absolutely loved it. And what I found super interesting was that this book, which you've called a memoir-ish, which it is, (laughs) doesn't include, you know, these big moments of, like, going to the Oscars or being in big movies. It's about these intimate very meaningful moments in your life that I so loved reading about how how did you select those moments because they do seem random in a sense they were obviously very meaningful at the time but they're they're small moments they're intimate yeah I think they were all uh, I think you can have inflection points in your life that aren't loud necessarily um, but that places that you really noticed some big change or a moment or they're things that I've thought about and they're certainly stories that I've told so when I was thinking about the book it's funny they just rise to the surface the 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 ideas for each of the essays I pretty much knew what they all were um because I've been telling these stories for a really long time and I've seen I've seen the effect that they've had on people just four people around you know my kitchen table or a bunch of people at a party, things that make people laugh or that hold people. You know, I can recognise, I'm can. i good at monitoring an audience and seeing what has an effect. So I sort of started there. And it's funny, I writing about, that. you know, what's that adage? There are no, there are no small parts, there are only small actors. It might have just been one of my acting teachers who said that, you know, which... I think it's true. <laughs> I think I, <laughs> I, I def- think it is. I think it is true. Yeah. But so I think there, in in a way, there are no small stories. Yeah, you're so right. Yeah. And and you're not only a brilliant storyteller, but you're a truth teller, which I love. And I think I've become a truth teller over the last few years, getting that sort of confidence to say what I feel and what I'm thinking, but also what my life has been like in in terms of how I express that to you know, people that listen to the podcast or read the books or whatever. And I love being a truth teller, but it can sometimes be problematic. Yeah, and I that, I must say, I would like a word with God or whomever, should I ever have the opportunity, as to why that is. Why, why is, I mean, obviously we're in this apparently post-truth world, but in terms of pointing things out, um, about behaviour or about people. I've never really understood why telling the truth is such a... Why you get in trouble for it. Mm. And particularly women. Particularly women. And in Britain. And in Britain. Like, particularly in Britain. It is and has been savage. Yeah. And um, it feels so um, uh, oppressive in the true meaning of the word. Um, and I'm... And I've sort of done trying to interrogate why it is, at, like you said, and you just, you just carry on. Yeah. And 
um, I think social media now has also become a way of dispatching the utter nonsense. How, however, much, however loathsome it can be, it is also a place that one can address um, the way in which people metabolize you as a known person. Yeah. Um, so you can you can definitely offer offer up your version of your truth to act as some sort of bulwark against the rubbish that is written about you or um, other people's opinions. But people are always going to opinion, like they opinion really hard. Yeah. I, I guess it's weird, especially on social media, when something's written down, typed out in, you know, black letters on a on a screen. It feels more weighty and... Mm. And of course, we forget that doesn't make it true, you know. And when you're talking about your life, your experience, that's true to you. There's no one, no one can really say anything about that or question it. That that's your truth and your story, and that's what I again loved about this book is that you're just telling us about your life. It's not up for grabs to debate or discuss. It's like this is my story, you know. If it resonates, brilliant. And you know, luckily, it's resonated massively with me, and I know it will many other people. And I wonder. Looking at your life in this way under such a microscope, was it quite interesting to look back at all of these moments, big or small, to see not only how they've impacted you, but how they've shaped you to become who you are sat here today? Yeah, definitely. I mean, you really feel when you're sitting down and writing stuff and like you said, looking at something in black and white, you're you're really confronted with you're confronted with yourself, you know, and it becomes an exploration. It can't help but become an exploration of that. Um, and it is funny how I so wish I could go back to those younger me's and and have a word with them and say lots of different things. Because in writing them, I really, I really understood better like where I was coming from. And it was so confusing at the time or you're just... You're sort of fighting your way through this jungle of expectation, like your own or what you think people expect from you, what my business, you know, being an actor, what people expected of me in that business. When was I supposed to say no? Apparently you're not allowed to say no. And if you do, you get punished. Like it's it's really, I'm so proud of like that little girl and young woman, really, because she got it in the neck from like all sides often. But I really feel um, like I really like who I am because I see that reflected in my son and in my partner, in my friends, in like the, the quality of the life that I live. Um, I know, I know I've done all right because I see how much love there is around me. Mm. in a way and I'm so grateful to that you know she was she was my own personal pioneer and isn't that like the best place to get to because I think I've certainly spent portions of my life looking back at younger versions of me and not only cringing like most of us will at periods of our life but also feeling self-loathing towards that version of myself sort of mortified by that version of myself mm -hmm. I'm certainly getting to a place where I'm much more accepting these days. I'm maybe not where you are, but that's certainly my aim, to get to a place where I go, well done, younger you. Like, I wouldn't be me today if it wasn't for everything you'd been through or experienced. And I think that's the goal, to get to that place. Yeah, I think so. And it's always going to be a work in progress. Like yeah. I'm, I'm that whole notion of that I still fall into that trap of thinking that there is a there there, that there is some arrival point of everything falling into place and that everything is fine and that I'm feeling great about all of it. Like that just doesn't that just doesn't exist. No. But there is a version of I think real um delight, compassion and fondness for those former versions of yourself. Um and you know, I wouldn't I wouldn't be here now sort of calm and as together as I've ever been, I suppose, if she hadn't been allowed to make those mistakes, you know, which is kind of what this whole, this current version of cancel culture is yeah. so, it makes it so terrifying because like young people can't, or anyone, you can't really make a mistake and learn from it and evolve publicly. Uh, 
you have to be punished. It's like this eternal, you have to put in, be put in these eternal stocks and have pies thrown at you. It's, it's so strange. It's wild. And I'm scared for my kid. Like yes, I'm same. scared for my kid and his mates. Like, what does that mean that you, that there is, that everybody is a version of the thought police if you, if you don't, if your opinion doesn't align with theirs? Um, I wonder, I wonder where that goes. Oh, I don't know, but I no. also can't bear it. You know, I, I definitely no, I worry for my kids. And I feel so grateful that starting my career, I didn't have the echo chamber of social media and that constant feedback in that way because it is so harsh and cancel culture does, well, it stops all of us from growing because as you've just said, you know, we have to make mistakes. We have to, especially when we're young, that's what it's all about is try new things. But and- also, like, I think trying to, trying to affect Trying to affect systemic change on systemic problems, how can there not be process involved in that? Like, you know, a system is only a system because it's been set up that way and dismantling that requires transformation. Like, that's just basic something. I mean, like, I can't think what the collective <laughs> term for that is, but I know... Something works perfectly. No, like, we're... It, everything is process. Mm. Why? It's so interesting that we... Maybe things had to become, you know, it's so weird how in one way we're being asked to become uh, non-binary in our approach. And yet this is the most binary part of our culture right now. It is black and white. You know, some people say you can say this, you cannot say this. You can think this, you cannot think that. You cannot make a mistake and be forgiven for it. Um but maybe that's all. This is also part of the evolution. You know, the pendulum yeah. swings really hard back the other way to try and right the infractions of the past. I think so. I don't know. I'm ask me another fifty years. Well, this is it. I mean, it it won't stay the same. That's for sure. Everything's yeah. always changing and evolving, and we can only hope that it goes in a better direction. That people are more forgiving, and we're more forgiving of ourselves, so that we can be more forgiving of other people. Because I think that's where it must stem from. Feeling. You know, we're giving ourselves such a hard time and it's much easier to deflect that onto strangers, essentially. Um, There's something I want to rewind on that you just said a moment ago, which was about not arriving there. And this is, again, a really important part of the book where you actually have this epiphany while you're in the bath on New Year's Day and you realise that on the horizon, there is more horizon. (laughs) And in that moment, you feel a bit of a sense of dread around that. But I wonder how you feel about that today. The horizon now is a way more positive and beautiful thing for me than it was. And I think that's largely because my mum dying in the middle of writing this book, suddenly the temporal nature of life. I know we know that, but I didn't know it. I just didn't know it. And now the idea that there, you know, there is sort of an end. There is like a sort of ultimate horizon weirdly just made me just appreciate all of it the stuff that feels distant the stuff that feels close up the stuff I can't quite reach um the stuff that is here and now it all feels like it is just part of this whole experiential enterprise that is living and being alive um and and even though the sort of lights out aspect of death and dying is sort of girds you and it's frightening it's also incredibly dynamic and um uh I mean I'm learning for it to be dynamic and it not just be frightening yeah because you you talk about that that we have this sense that 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 finality and the end and death is the thing that we fear and it's bleak and it's scary but we don't fear what comes before birth which I thought was so interesting like I've never even thought about that what is the bit before why aren't we scared of that exactly it's its own oblivion because we don't really know what exactly. happens at either end. So exactly. that lovely sort of circular motion perhaps makes it less terrifying. Yeah, I mean the kind of pre and post consciousness. Like we and I, I, I've, I will say it to anyone who'll listen. Like having given birth to a child and having been with my mother as she died, they are so akin to one another. Birth and death. There is this this strong journey. And this transformation, and just because I don't have all of the the pieces, like I don't know what my son was pre consciousness, I don't know what my mother is post. 
but um, I love them both and I feel that there is transformation in both of those journeys and there's something incredibly beautiful and galvanizing about that and I think it's okay for that to exist along with one's absolutely normal typical fear of death and dying but also to have this kind of secret knowledge that that it's something more than that and that feels really good like and there's nothing like being in the depths of grief to really explore those ideas and know that they are the the rawest truest version of of you as a human metabolizing them because there's just nowhere to hide from it i mean and you explore that in that the last chapter of the book that's dedicated to your mum is just well it's again it's everything it's so so moving but it's also there's you know you you explore grief as a very complex emotion so beautifully because it, it it's so harsh and brutal but there's funny moments in there there's you know wildly unexpected moments in there there's nightmarish moments in there and you just dive into all of it and, and get stuck into it how how did you find writing about that with it being very fresh and and so personal well it was so necessary that was what was like uh what was so kind of ghoulish and i i tried not to judge myself at the time but i was I was taking notes when we were in the hospital and I, t- I talked to mum about it. But it was because I knew I needed to leave a breadcrumb trail. I knew that I had every chance that I would block out the whole thing and I did not want to do that. And it wasn't because I was writing a book. It was because I needed, I knew I was going to need to go back and be able to remember exactly what happened to comfort myself and be able to comfort my sister who does block things out and my brother and say this is what happened in case we ever need to know this is what it was it the these were the hilarious moments these were the devastating moments this is what it really looked like and I did think it was going to derail the the book when when she died I couldn't write about anything else except her dying and it wasn't fit to be shared with anyone but weirdly it was by kind of going into it and really looking at it and really telling the story I I told my way out of it and then um, in the same way like I, I talk about it in that essay like when my son was a child the, when my son was a baby like the way that he would get over his his pain and his fear was to tell the story and just witnessing it just standing there listening you know I fell over it hurt you fell over it hurt I don't want to play with Johnny again. You don't want to play with Johnny again. Like it's the acknowledgement of this, whatever the tragedy is, somehow frees it up to just become a memory, to become something that happened to you rather than something that keeps happening to you and keeps you held in some kind of emotional amber, Mm. you know? So writing about it was really cathartic. It was very painful. It is very difficult to read that chapter still. Um, it was properly difficult doing the audio book of it. I mean, oh. the poor bloke recording me. Like, I kept, I kept bursting into tears. But I think that's you know that's normal. Like, it would be weird if you didn't. You know. Yeah, and it's so much healthier for you and everyone and the process to feel it and express it rather than hold it in. And you know, I'm sure we've all done that over the years, whether it's grief or shame or whatever trauma we've dealt with in life that we we don't want to deal with it we want to keep it suppressed and pushed down but you can't really move through it if you're doing that you have to go through it and and let it out yeah and I think that's kind of the function of like of 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 movies and of television and also of books like memoirs and other books like they give they give someone a a an outside way of of experiencing these things, mm. maybe they will, you know, reading a book or watching a movie will encourage you to interrogate that in yourself. Maybe it's cathartic enough to go and laugh uproariously in a movie and feel that 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 expression of joy um, without having to actually see it in your life, or grief or sadness, and it's somehow safe. And I've I've always thought, you know, I think that's what I think that's what actors and authors do in a way is like. They just have act as conduits for that emotion and offer people who maybe don't want to live in that place. They don't want emotion to be their currency. They haven't got the time or the energy or it's too frightening. Yeah. Um, I think that's sort of why 
that's why actors and writers exist in a way. Oh yeah, I mean I've had so many moments watching films where I've like the other day I was just I was watching something on Disney Plus about polar bears and I was weeping and I was like okay, I know that this is sad, but this is something else. Like there's something <laughs> else coming out that I've been suppressing. What are these polar bear bears bringing to the surface here? And I think you're so right. It's it's the most brilliant way of getting stuck stuff out by releasing those emotions and and letting them be free. And I wonder, because, you know, the stuff we're talking around here, uh, around grief, but also around birth and us not really knowing what is at either end of that. And I didn't grow up in a religious household. I don't no, think you I did. Didn't did either, you? So no. we don't necessarily have the language for this stuff. And even when you're, you know, you're talking in the book about, say, manifesting, you're, you're in Uruguay, you're with your friend Miguel, and you're talking about... <laughs> you know, the law of attraction, whatever you want to call it, and him telling you to sort of ditch the timeline and just go with it. Or in the moments where you're talking about um, sort of saying, you know, becoming an actor was the the last thing you felt you'd really cultivated on your own. Everything else felt a bit accidental. or Something else had agency over what was going on. And I wonder, do, do you have a language or any particular beliefs when looking at life in that way, what is it that has agency over us? You know, looking at the destiny, fate versus what we're in control of situation. Oh, my God. I mean, you know, like everyone, I struggle with this all the time. But I do, I don't, I do think that the only meaning that there is in life is, is, is what we assign to it. It's what we choose to assign meaning to. I I think, I personally believe that it's sort of, I think it's odd to think that we are the only energetic kind of force <clears throat> in the universe. Yeah. I do feel that there is something, some power bigger than us. I do believe in a kind of source energy. But again, I don't know. I don't know if that's mind generated or if that's known, if that's something... Um, but I do know that that life is just purely experiential. I, I personally don't think that there is meaning beyond that. I think it is what you choose to what you choose to do, like how you choose to spend this incredibly short amount of time that we have here. It is a flash. It is just a flash. Yeah. I mean, and we can elongate those moments, but it really is. It, it really is. And whether that is. The most of your day is, you know, looking at a house plant or, you know, cooking something for someone you love or whether it is going out and saving the planet or curing a disease or writing a book. It's choice and experience. And and it does seem that love is the cornerstone of all of that, like the nicest, the nicest, strongest cornerstone mm. um, and gives context to all the totally unknowable shit that we deal with i mean i think we're all we're all just trying to find meaning where i i don't think there is meaning i think there's just experience mm. it's just the doing of it um and what what does that feel like what does that feel like for you and what does that feel like for the people around you mm. yeah i agree i mean i <clears throat> i don't have any beliefs set in stone at all. It, I love exploring that subject. I'm so fascinated by it. it was, what, that was my whole last book was about that. Yeah. Just looking at like, what the hell is all this? Yeah. And what are we doing? And does is this does this ha- have meaning? And if I do this, will it have meaning? And I'm ever curious about that. I think it's so so fascinating. And also, when looking at time, like you're saying, we're here for the shortest time, which is sort of terrifying, but really gets you moving and into action with certainly gratitude and and looking for that meaning and I weirdly had a day like it yesterday but nothing really happened yesterday it had a couple of voiceovers which is very normal for me there was nothing exceptional about the day but for some reason I noticed maybe it was because I just read your book and I and we're sort of pinpointing all these sort of intimate moments but I noticed a sort of a small list of things that felt cool for for no reason like I had a really nice chat with one of our postmen and he was having a bit of a rough time and we were just sort of chatting about life I thought that was a really great little moment there then I went into the park and there was a 
a hilarious moment where I saw a woman having to pin her dog to the floor because deer started to chase it. <laughs> and I was like, shit, I'm watching like a real life drama. And then no one got hurt. So it was just funny. So I thought that was a really cool moment. That was just like she was literally wrestle, wrestling him and pinning him to the floor. Tiny little sort of Scotty dog. But it was a brilliant moment. And... Often I just don't think about those moments. They whiz past and I go to bed and it was just like, oh, it was another day. But for some reason, and I reckon it probably is your book, I've been sort of just noting those moments a bit more. And that's, you know, that's where you find the meaning, I guess. I think, I mean, I I think that's exactly it. It's like being aware of, being aware of what is happening to you mm. and not judging that it's not what you think it should be. Yeah. This idea of expecting it to be, which I think we all do, we set this bar of what we think our life should be in order to be meaningful. But I I think you have to remove the I think you have to remove the pressure of I think we search for meaning because we're frightened. I we're really so scared. do. We're all scared about what why are we here? We need to have a concrete reason. We need to know what it is because surely we have to know that before we die. Yeah. Um but I think that's just a function of being um, of being a human being. You know, we've set up all these structures which I think are meant to make us feel safe of, you know, you go to school and you learn something and then you get a job and you get married and you have children and we give ourselves this kind of scaffold to tether ourselves to because otherwise yeah. we're just ah! flo- yeah, we're just sort of <laughs> floating in this in this free fall yeah. of why are we <clears throat> of why are we here? So if you say, well, I've got to pay the mortgage. Yeah. It somehow becomes manageable. Mm. Oh, I'm going to get married. Oh, I'm going to get a dress. Now, that is really like six months of <laughs> distraction. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, is I it? Know. I sometimes, I have to stop myself sometimes from going, this is, I think this is also a function of like the fact that I'm still grieving. You know, it's been a year. It was a year on March the 14th and where are we, April, um, that mum died of of feeling this existential idea of was there meaning if she if she was here in all of this glory and all of this meaning to me and now she's gone did that mean anything and the fact is that i mean it does and it doesn't and i think that's okay but it's also quite a frightening feeling that gives you it makes you feel like you've got vertigo um I know, because once you start dismantling it, you can question every Everything. bit of your life and go, well, what's the point of that? Why do I do that? Why do I care so much about this dynamic? And <laughs> you can get to the point where you go, none of it does really matter. Like there are bits yeah. like love, like you're saying that cornerstone. Yeah. We need that and we're humans and that does, we know, we feel that. But all the intricate little tiny bits that we worry about and ponder, does it matter? I don't think I don't think it does. Mm. I think that is brain that is sort of reptilian brain stuff and culturally what's pushed on us perhaps. Yeah, hugely and being yeah. asked to being asked to worry and consider huge global events that we can we can affect change in small ways perhaps but ultimately there is this low hum of menace about yeah. like I I wake up every morning and I think about Zelensky and all those people in the Ukraine. And it, I have this feeling, it's in like background noise yeah. in, in my day, of feeling that is going on and there's nothing I can do beyond send money, focus my attention, um, offer shelter if I could. You know, I, it's, I think we're all faced with these, these really big, these really big things. And I do believe that a way of dealing with that, like as a human and like as a, my idea of what a kind person is is just to bring everything back to the present moment like to really just examine that and to be in that moment because genuinely um you can only really plot your coordinates from this moment and it is easier said than done but I think you still have to say it and then you have to do it as often as you possibly can because it's it's I think that's I think that's where life is it's yeah. only here yeah that is all there is is the bit we're in right this second yeah. which is ever moving and ephemeral and you can't quite grab it but that's yeah the- and e- and honestly even when even when you're watching life ending you're still that present moment is it, it's so interesting it's like time 
kind of ceased to exist like as mum was dying because it was still it was like the distillation of life like really the purest the purest form of it because we were so aware and I almost like technicolor like a sort of spiritual technicolor it was so or pure oxygen it was unadulterated and I think that there's it's a really amazing thing to remember in what one might consider a boring day or a hard day or, you know, an irritating day. It's to kind of find those moments where you really felt that pure connection to what it is to live and take a breath with that in your mind. Mm. And it it makes you feel different. It might not change your whole day, but it might change that moment. Yeah. It, so interesting you talking about that technicolor quality. We had... um. Clover Stroud on with oh, yeah. her book. Um, and her book's called The Colour of My Blood. Is that right? I reckon it's that. <laughs> the Colour of My Blood. And it's all about um, the time when her sister died and seeing everything in that technical you've, you know, I've heard this before when people talk about grief, that everything is heightened yeah. and shinier and brighter and more real almost and that, that's such an interesting dichotomy of like death bring all of all of it to light it's so wild it's amazing and we don't we we never we don't talk about no. we don't talk about that we don't talk about how 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 death can enhance life like as a you know as a happening and as a construct that it is um it's this frightening bookend for most of us, you know, as opposed to this thing that gives definition to, you know, that is the shadow of, of life. Mm. It gives definition to the light. Um, and there's something mysterious and unknowable. Well, it is mysterious and unknowable. Um, but there's loads of things in life that are mysterious un and unknowable. Um, why, of most of it. Most of it. Like, <laughs> yeah. why does it? Why does a love work out with one person but not with another? Yeah. Why do certain things befall certain people in our world? You know, um, there's a lot. There's a lot going on, and I think uh, allowing anything to help define that, to give shape to it, to give, um, to give a version of meaning, is worth at least looking at. Mm. or interrogating because if you just look at the mortgage and the worry and the heartbreak um i think that's i do think that's pretty much all you you'll get yeah um, it goes back to that sort of law of attraction yeah and you you, thing, what you're you, focusing are, on. you yeah like what was it i someone said the other day that you can't hear what's on you can't hear what's on 98.7 FM if you're tuned to 102.2 yeah you just <laughs> you can't you can sit looking at 102 going, god I really want to listen to that song <laughs> I really want to listen to that song and it's playing on 98.7 but I can't you it's you know I, I that. do think that it's I know I used a little I used a radio analogy I love a radio so and I an old that. school one at so that I did that mini. FM I not it. even not even dab <laughs> um, <laughs> you know what, although I know that Losing your mum has brought a lot of this to the surface, and then I'm sure writing this book and examining your life in such a way has has you know, landed you with that realization. But it's clear in the book that you've been looking at life a bit outside the box since you were a tiny kid, and I don't know if that if you feel that's because that's just how you are. You were born into this world with a curious mind, or due to life events. You know, you had a childhood with a lot of interesting areas to look at with you know your mum and dad having very different lifestyles that you flitted between and 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 going to boarding school and how that must have impacted you I wonder if you feel like it is sort of more experience led or naturally that is just how you turned up well I think about that I can only really think about it I think about it more easily when I think of my son because I feel like he came in with this Henryness, yeah. that is still I see that I've watched it grow like a sunflower every day since the moment he was born. I've watched that Henryness, the essence of him, and he came in with that. Yeah. I didn't teach it to him. There is lots of things that I have taught him, lots of things, but I do think there is an inherent essence, and I for sure came in with this 
this ability to articulate emotion and for that to be my currency and definitely for to have to sort of started out for that to be very very difficult for the people around me um they didn't know how to calibrate to that emotion they didn't really know how to deal with it i was sent away or put in my room or a lot however i was often sent to places that were amazing <laughs> so <laughs> and being put in my room became a really creative place mm. and I ultimately really understood even though it was agony and I think that they sometimes did a crap job I understand why my parents couldn't deal with it because of their own stories like when I finally understood you know my dad had crazy PTSD from World War II and like emotion to him like was just that was just terrifying my mother had been thrown out of her house when she was 16 by the woman her father married and had to fend for herself. Emotion for her, again, you'd crumble if you gave in to that. So there they were, like, faced with this child who just, you know, wanted to, wanted to feel everything and in a big way. Like, I get it. Yeah. Um, but I see, you know, my son has big feelings, but we've... What's lovely is, like, I totally knew how to deal with them. And I felt so, I'm so happy that that, I learned something that I could then give him. Like, that, that is evolution, right, yeah. right there. Yeah, no, it is. I mean, you talk about getting sent away. One of the most sort of jaw-dropping stories in the book is when your dad sends you from Barbados, <laughs> where he is, to oh, London... And you have to do an overnight in Miami and you're 11. Yeah. And you seem to deal with it, again, with curiosity rather than, I'm terrified, this is awful. You're sort of sat by the pool chatting to gangsters and yeah. having a great time. Yeah, it was really... Uh... The thing is, I've always been like, oh, we're in this now. Oh, this is happening now. Okay, so this is happening. This is what's happening. And there might be fleeting moments of, oh, my God, that, that vertiginous feeling I was talking about of yeah. having vertigo. But usually it's like, all right, well, I'm in this situation, so let's just let's just be in it and like see what happens. Like I was aware at 11, being by myself in what I now know to be one of the most notoriously like bananas hotels in Miami. <laughs> in 1981, it was sort of a repository of like cocaine and gangsters. And I like arrived with my penguin and my blanket. <laughs> Like, all right, I think there's a reservation under driver. <laughs> the people were like, where's your dad? And I was like, not here. In Barbados. Exactly. <laughs> where's your mum? Also not here. <laughs> so I was curious and I was enraged and I was sad and I was adventurous. And I think that that is probably sums up my whole life. Like, mm. I... You know, I cry about stuff and I worry about stuff, but I'm also really curious about it. And even when I'm meant to shut up, I probably won't about stuff. But I know all these things to be true at this point. Mm. Um, and I think that, I mean, God knows, like leaving your kid alone in a hotel for a day and a night in Miami... Like, that is bonkers. Yeah, but when you're a kid, you don't know any different. You think this <laughs> yeah, is you normal. Think it's normal. Well, you just think this is what's happening. Yeah, so, you think, oh, right. this is, you know, I look back at some parts of my life and starting work young, and I at the time thought this is all very normal. And you can then reflect and look back and go, oh, my God, that's not normal. That was not normal at all. That's not normal at all. I mean, but it's a great story. Yeah, and I mean, I think that it, it is a great story, and it, great it story. was. Yeah. And it was... It was really fun. Yeah, I'm sure. Great fun. And when you talk about these big emotions, again, I've massively resonated with this. I still have huge emotions and I feel very sensitive to things going on around me. And you talk about when you were younger and going to raves in the countryside and sort of bombing down the A40 to a random field. Yeah. You would be one of the very few people yeah. not off your tits. Yes. You would be there presently oh, that, wanting. That's not to say there weren't times that I got off my tits. Like, sure. Let's be, but but in, if, if there was driving involved and going to, that was very much. You would do it. And it was particularly in that moment, it was particularly in that summer of not, my life just feeling like it had just just tanked before it had even begun. Um, and I was going there to like literally dance it off. 
And there was something about, I mean, I write about that, that notion of like facing this sort of apparent oblivion. And I didn't want to be high doing it. I really wanted, and it was, you know, they were so gross, those raves, but the music was amazing. (laughs) Mm. And it was, and dancing has always been something that I love and something that I will lose myself in. I don't really need to be off my tits on a knee no I don't dance enough but I certainly remember I used to love dancing I used to do it sort of as a hobby but also just going to a club or whatever and losing yourself and I did drink a lot back then but now if I go to like a wedding which is probably about as ravey as it gets yeah I I mean, I'm such a lightweight anyway, I can barely drink. I have like half a gin and tonic and I'm like, oh my God, I need to go home immediately. I either get sort of sleepy, but also linking it back to those big emotions. I feel it all more. So if I've got a worry, that worry is accentuated tenfold. And I'm like, why did I do that? I'm now in an absolute paranoid spiral about it, which is good because I've sort of, I haven't stopped drinking, but I rarely drink. So I so understand that, wanting to feel whatever you're feeling with clarity rather than... I mean, some people will drink or take drugs to numb it, but for me, it is the opposite. Mm-hmm. It's bigger, it's bolder, mm-hmm. it's brighter. Mm-hmm. No, thank you very much. Yeah, that's. That, I think that's exactly how it was for mm. me, the same thing. Like, the times in my life that I did drugs were when I was actually just feeling happiest and calmest. I don't think that... Um, and I don't really drink either. I'm a lightweight as well. Yeah. And this was all, I think that was all that kind of early 20s, early 20s thing. But God, I I still, I mean, I still dance. I still dance with an amazing group of women today. Um, and it is the best, the best outlet. Apart from surfing, it is the greatest or things that involve taking your clothes off it is the best (laughs) it is the best fun thing exercise so when you're dancing are you dancing like you're going to a a group where you do something yeah go to go to go to dance works and my friend joe manukian organized this unbelievable class with miranda Uh, she is like a proper musical theater dancer oh, like you've love. seen her in shows on the west at like and she choreographs like proper choreography not just having a bit of a dance around like really so hard this it's amazing. amazing you can come i want to because that's what I did. my whole childhood was that at the weekends and then as i got older i thought you can't really do that as an adult but you can you can there are places that facilitate that. there are places that you can go to dance and then also like going out to dance like i will yeah love definitely that. go out to dance yeah. go to a place heaven um, i love it and that, so let's talk about surfing because I, I i don't surf i've probably surfed twice in my life but i love being in the sea yeah i love swimming in freezing water or in lukewarm water in the summer but there's something about getting in the sea and there's several moments in the book you talk about that need to be in the sea and you you say there was one point when you were living in malibu and you were sort of dealing with a bit of self-loathing but when you were in the sea gone it just annihilated it yeah, I've always found, I found the sea or an ocean to be completely therapeutic, like truly. Like I've never gone for a swim and not like, and not got out feeling differently about how I, the thing I was worrying about. Because I'll definitely do that if I'm irritated and worried, like I live right by the ocean. Mm. And if I wake up or if I'm having a panic or something, it is just a cure-all for me is to to jump in and swim for as long as I can. Do you think that's, you know, I've wondered this myself. When I'm in there, I can't really think of much else because it's so bloody freezing. Yes. I'm usually just like in Dorset. You know, maybe slightly warmer, less so, but there must be something else going on. Just the fact that you know it's so much more powerful than this tiny human that you are and you have to just go with it. What what do you think think it is for you? I think it's that. I think it's the connection with your breath that you absolutely have to. Your brain, your brain, your worrying brain just has to stop because physical, physical you is taking over of survival whilst also feeling, you know, this ancient... Hmm this ancient thing holding you that you are in. So there's this, I, again, I think there's this idea of time and going on and evolution. I don't know. I think, I think it 
probably appeals to a lot of the different. It calms one side of our brain down. It stops the monkey mind or the reptilian brain or whatever. And then you get to actually be in that stroke, like the that stroke of swimming with your breath. It's meditative. Mm. Plus, it's so beautiful. And, oh, it's so you know, beautiful. Um, There's and nothing what, better. And the sound I and know. the smell, like it's all encompassing. Yeah, and I feel, I think the ancient feeling of it as well is like, oh, this has been here so many millions of years before me. Yeah. This water was here. here when there were like dinosaurs walking around yeah. and I'm in it. Yeah. That's kind of mind blowing. Yeah. I don't and, think I've thought about that before. And think how long the dinosaurs were around for. I mean, relatively, we were literally just a blip. Like we've barely, <laughs> we've barely been here. But we're fucking up the world in this I blip, know. which it's is okay. the most depressing thing. You know what? It The world's going to be fine. It's us that won't be fine. I know. Neil, we're such Neil, idiots. Uh, What's his name? Neil deGrasse Tyson, who's a uh, an American thinker and scientist. He's he's constantly saying that on Twitter about how when people go, you know, we've got to save the world, and he's like, the world's going to be fine. Oh, nature it's, will keep doing its thing. Yeah, it's, it's us. It's people who will be, you know, if we continue to behave like a virus, you know. But that's, I don't think that should be depressing. I think it should be galvanizing. And, and hopefully that's how we affect change. Yeah. Whenever we've done sort of environmental episodes of the podcast, I think the message is like, we fucked it up very quickly so we can fix it quite quickly because we can make change we very all know quickly. What we, we all know what we've got to do. do. And all those yeah. corporations know what they, and conglomerates yes. and countries know what they have to do. Look how quickly we came together to find a vaccine. It took literally 12 months. Yeah. When people want to do something, how quickly they got rid of aerosols, people stopped buying them. They got rid of them pretty damn quickly. It's it's wild. It's just, it's kind of that focus. And it's it's hard when there are, you know, huge corporate bodies that they need to change. Yeah. And lobbying and governments need to change. And that's that can take longer and be trickier, but and be quite depressing but we must have hope yeah we, we must that's the only thing is hope 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 um i also wanted to talk to you about motherhood we've t- touched on it a little bit but you describe a feeling of um knowing you were going to bring your son into the world on your own as initially you were very scared about that but then this amazing natural feeling of being invincible sort of kicked in and you were like, I know I'm going to be absolutely fine. And I wonder if that continued through parenting Henry and, and how you've sort of moved through that and hopefully kept hold of that feeling of invincibility. I think what I... Do I feel invincible? No, not at all. But around Henry, for some reason, and I think he just brought... You know, the Irish say the babies bring their own luck. I just... I never doubted like I didn't I didn't admit doubt because he was just pure love and represented that all my fear and worry like I I didn't bring that into the bubble and even when there were times where you know maybe I didn't have as much money as coming in as and I wasn't sure about like what was going to happen like how is our how is our life going to be it all I always knew it, it would somehow it would work out. And I did have this incredible woman who I met when he was nine months old, who was his nanny. Um, but that that it that title just doesn't do her justice because she is just she's like another grandmother. She's part of our family. She's she she is what allowed me to work. She gave me so much support and love about being a mother and talking about having raised you know four children of her own and. Um, this huge extended family like I learned so much about how to just uh how to just be in it and and I work really really hard I changed I changed my life I stopped making movies because I was like it's too I can't I can't plan I can't wait for a movie to show up or maybe there's a year where the right film doesn't come along or you know a great movie but they're paying me tuppence I need to just go and make television. That is where money is. I need to pri- I need to provide that. I need to pay this amazing woman so that I can go do this and I can be local to where my baby is and watch him grow up. So I found a house that was 10 minutes from the studio. 
I told my agent, please find me the television show that is called Shoots in Los Angeles. And <laughs> that is what we did. And I did that for seven years. That's amazing. And that, it, I think, so the invincibility, that, that was part of me just going, no, now I'm going to build, I'm going to build this nest and I'm going to make it really strong because it is really frightening. And it is just me. It's me providing the parenting and it's me providing the money. So I'm going to figure out a way of doing that. And and it was it was amazing. I didn't meet my partner, like who is really a proper partner and a proper, you know, partner with Henry until four years ago. So it's, and it's okay. Like I look at, I know that it's okay because Henry's amazing. And Sarah, his nanny is still, you know, in our life in a, in a huge way is our great friend now. It's so lovely. And I think time and time again, you know, I I feel a sense of shock that someone at your level with your experience, with your back catalogue of films and music and TV has that work insecurity. But of yeah. course, in the industry you work in, that is rife. Like that's what kind of keeps it churning is the insecurity that there won't be another film, there won't be another show. Yep. And I think it is quite shocking again and again to sort of hear that because there is an assumption like, oh, Minnie Driver, she'll be all right. She's doing loads of stuff. She's got this whole back catalogue of amazing films and awards and whatever, but it just doesn't work like that. No, it doesn't. Or it hasn't for me. It's always been, like, work is something I've I've always had to fight for. And I don't, I don't know why that is, but I also, having observed so many different careers I know that it is something that most actors fear even ones that you just wouldn't you wouldn't believe like you would not believe I mean only the other day I just was standing on the beach with this mate of mine who's a really successful actor in such demand and he was like god I want to take some time off I just don't know if I do like will that be work (laughs) when I come back and I was like you You'll be are fun. insane. I'm going to slap <laughs> you right now. But so I do think it's part of being an actor. But for me, I also know it's like I've had to fight for stuff. Has there ever been a point where you thought, don't do this anymore? Oh, God, yeah. Oh, my God. Oh, God, yeah. But I love it. I love it so much. I wish that I, I wish that I would go and do something else, like in a way. Because I ha- I hate wanting to do something that you need other people's permission to do. Yes. You know, um, I do quite like the autonomy. It's why it was lovely writing, lovely writing a book because it's just you. No one is uh, synthesizing you. Not a director or an editor or a producer, or a cameraman, or DP, pro- you know, studio. It's just you. Just the odd 50 people telling you how exactly. to be. Um, mm. So... Yeah, there's loads of other things. And maybe I will, you know. I, yeah. I I don't I don't think that anything's off the table. You can always do anything if you choose to. You've got to write another book. I hope so. I don't know. I'm not quite sure what it'd be about. But don't worry, but you're so good. You have to do another I mean, one. You write loads of books. How do you know? How do you figure out what you're going to write your next book about? Usually something awful happens and I go, great, I've got a book there. <laughs> <laughs> that's my mate Emma. That. Oh my God, that's so funny. That's like... My friend Emma Forrest has a book called Busy Being Free coming out in August and she writes these memoirs about her life like, and stuff just happens and I watch it happen in real time and then I go, oh, well, there's another there's book. There's a book. There's a book right there. I know, isn't it funny? Because sometimes I'll have quite frank discussions with my publisher and they'll go, oh, do you think you could write about this subject? And I, I feel uncomfortable it being prescribed, like I need to just mm. something to happen. Maybe it will be something wonderful and that will inspire a book. But, but historically, they've been sort of through things that I haven't loved experiencing, but have mm. been really meaty. And um, and you kind of can already sense they're probably going to resonate because we're all underneath, you know, flapping about underwater, trying our best to look really graceful on the top. And That's exactly it. Whatever. And so, you know, but you, whatever you write about, you have to because you are it's just so beautiful. To, it's like poetic at times. It's Thank cool. well, you. Well, throughout, it's gorgeous. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. I really do. It oh, was it was it. an extraordinary experience writing it. I'm sure. And thank you. It means a lot. And also, <laughs> like, finishing the book with that beautiful picture of your mum was just... Most, oh, I that took that picture. That picture was gorgeous. I know. It was a good one of her. Oh, it's so lovely. She was magic. She was pure magic. She'd be so proud. I mean, she was so proud that I was doing it. But she would just... She would just be so chuffed. Oh. Yeah. 
That's gorgeous. Oh, thank you. Well, thank you so much. And thank you for Thanks having. for coming round to the house. It's just been a joy talking to you. It's been lovely talking to you. I really appreciate it. 